Welcome to our episode of Biblical Archaeology, From the Ground Down. Presented by Bible Interact and hosted by Dr. George Sparks. Join us as we explore the fascinating world of the Bible from leading experts in the field of archaeology. Welcome, folks. My name is Dr. George Sparks, and this is Biblical Archaeology from the Ground Down, sponsored by Bible Interact. Today, I got another really interesting program for us all. And with me is Dr. Dave Graves, David Graves, PhD from Aberdeen, Scotland. Um, well, it's University from Aberdeen, Scotland, where he received his PhD. He is actually a native of Canada. He has been involved in teaching the Bible and archaeology for more than 35 years. He is a retired assistant professor uh, from Liberty University, Rawlings School of Divinity in Litchburg, Virginia. He has taught archaeology at Oxford University, England. He has provided tours of the Ashmolean as well as the British Museum. And he's traveled pretty extensively throughout the Middle East. He has also been at the Mount Ararat Research Project and is a consultant or was the consultant at National Geographic Productions. He has been involved also in archaeology at the excavations at Qumran, the Temple Mount, and Shiloh in Israel, as well as Tel El Hamam in Jordan, where Dr. Grace was my square supervisor. In 2017, he was part of a team who excavated the Dead Sea Scroll Cave 53 near Qumran. Later, after identifying that it was a cave which contained Dead Sea Scrolls, it is now cave listed as Q12, Qumran 12. For many years, Dr. Graves has been a field supervisor, once again at Tel El Hamam. Extensively, extensively at this location, Middle Bronze period, and also the finding uh, excavator of the lost city of Livius, a Roman Byzantine period. Um, he is also a member of the Near Eastern Archaeological Society, NEAS. He has authored, as we all know, a number of books and published through his company, Electronic Christian Media, ECM. In addition, he has authored a number of journal articles on the Bible and archaeology, mostly available through academia.edu. Welcome to the program, Dr. David Graves. Oh, good to be with you, George, as always. Absolutely. Fun day today. So we got an interesting topic today. We're going to be talking about the Merneptha Stele today. The question is, was Israel laid waste? Wow, great so topic. This is, yeah, this is kind of an interesting one. Um, I inserted the Merneptha Stele here in an AI-generated background for Egypt, uh, just for context. Um, it was discovered by Sir Flinders Petrie, and here is his colorized image that I've uh, produced that's a beautiful slide. I'd like to blow it up and frame it, put it on my wall. Yeah, that's, I like the way it turned out. Um, the material, of course, is in the Archaeology of Biblical People, the book that I wrote um, with the footnotes for anybody that wants to dig a little deeper. Well, the time periods we're talking about, Egyptian chronology can be a bit confusing, uh, but here are the dates for the different periods in the Egyptian chronology. Uh, they're different from the uh, Israeli chronology that we use. We usually use Calcolithic or Bronze Age or Middle Bronze or Late or Iron Age. So, But in Egypt, they use kingdoms, the Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, New Kingdom, Late Period, so forth. But here are the dates. The time period we're talking about is a new kingdom uh, for the Merneptah Stelae. And uh, this is Merneptah. This is what he looks like, one of the busts of the Cairo Museum. Typical, the name the name is actually here and the cartouche on his shoulder uh, for his name. So that's how we know that's, that is the pharaoh. He's got his name on his shoulder. So there's not a lot of doubt in that. The New Kingdom comprises all of these pharaohs, and this is a bit of a chronology. Um, I just pulled this off of Wikipedia. But... Uh, the names of the pharaohs are pretty accurate, and they also have throne names. So uh, Egyptian pharaohs have usually three names. So they have a throne name and a personal name, 
and then they had another name. Uh, but the, the cartouches generally have those two names, the throne name and the personal name, um, two circles with the uh, hieroglyphics in them. There are the dates, and there's a little bit of information about them. Uh, the individual we're going to talk about is this fellow right down here, Merneptha, 13th son of Ramses II. They were quote, quite prolific. They had a lot of children, 13th, 13, 1213 to 1203 BC. So that's the New Kingdom. Ramses I, Seti, Ramses II, we all, or some might be familiar with Ramses II. He was the great builder. Um, and then uh, Amon Messe. So here's a timeline that I've put together. Uh, we have 1446 for the early date, for those that hold to an early date of the Exodus. And then we have the conquest for the early date, 1406. Uh, the, the Exodus for the late date would be 1224 BC. Uh, that's what they accept to be that date. Uh, the Merneptah Stele is dated to 1208 BC. So it places it here um, after both the early date and the late date. So it really doesn't help us much in determining. Um, it actually mentions Israel. So Israel was in existence at the time of the Merneptah Stele for the Egyptians, whether it was the late date or the early date. And this would be the time period of the judges, generally accepted if you told to the early date through here. Uh, the pharaohs that are ruling are down here on the bottom. Uh, these are not exact the way I have them divided up, but it gives you a sense of, of generally how they would fall along the, uh, the timeline. There's a bunch of pharaohs that, that were reigning in this period that I haven't included. I didn't have room, but Tutmosis III would be the pharaoh of the Exodus for the early date. And then, of course, uh, Ramses II is the pharaoh of the late date. Here is my timeline setting out the judges, the conquering judges, Othniel, and then, of course, suppressing nations that were suppressing the judges in the different periods of colorized them to help. So Ehud the, was, was fighting against the Moabites and Deborah, the Canaanites, and Gideon, the Midianites. So it kind of gives you a sense of, of how things were laid out here in the judges period. Um, and the pharaohs of the new kingdom are laid on the bottom here for you. Merneptha is right here. That's who we're talking about with the Merneptha Stele. So that's where it would fall if you um, sort of laid things out according to the early date. The late date would push the, the dates um, further down the line. Uh, the Egyptian pharaohs, um, just to mention, we have the early date, the middle date, and the late date. So the literal numbers, the formal numbers, and the archaeological numbers. And so here are the different dates for the oppression. Uh, there's the pharaohs of the Exodus, according to the three different dates. So Tutmosis III or Ramses II. Merneptah Stele then after we put things in context, was discovered by Sir Flinders Petrie, as I'd mentioned, down in Thebes. The artifact, the stele, is displayed at the Cairo Museum uh, in Egypt today. And the biblical significance is one of the earliest ex extra-biblical records of a people group called Israel. Um, there's also four others. We'll, well, I'll mention those in a moment. Uh, but it's important because it mentions Israel they understood in Egypt that Israel was a, uh, a nation that was um, to be contended with. This is the place where it was identified, it was located. I have it behind my head here as my background today. The um, Egyptian hieroglyphics states, Israel, waste, seed, grain, his, its. So its seed is laid waste, as you read it in Egyptian hieroglyphics. So every text and relief within the Karnak Temple complex listed a pharaoh's accomplishments and his expressed gratitude to the gods for making it all possible. There are no defeat, defeats recorded here, and even victories are often overstated. I, I was on a podcast, or somebody posted 
something on Facebook, I think, the other day about um, complaining about, well, why is the Egyptian exodus mentioned in all the Egyptian records? You think if all those people left Egypt, they would have mentioned it. Well, I mean, it's really easy to respond to that. They don't want to look bad and uh, show that uh, they've been defeated. They don't want to record that. They want to put a, a good face. I mean, it's it's propaganda, just like today. You turn on the TV and you watch CNN, what do you get? You get a bunch of propaganda uh, from the left side of things, uh, pr promoting things according to um, their views. Uh, the Egyptians were no different. They did the exact same thing. So they're not going to be advertising their loss and how all of these slaves left and how all of their soldiers were were killed in the Dead Sea or the Reed Sea. Not the Dead Sea, sorry, the Reed Sea. They're gonna they're gonna want to take and and put a good face on it for for Egypt. And we have that actually. Uh, when one pharaoh comes to rule, what does he do? He takes a chisel and he um, chisels out the previous pharaoh's accomplishments. So he doesn't even want his uh, previous pharaoh to be um, exalted in the record. So it's not uncommon for them to do that. There's the bust of Merneptas I mentioned, I showed earlier. So probably the classic example is Merneptas boast of the destruction of Israel. So here we have an example of how they treated um, their enemies in, in Israel in bragging about it. While his mention of Israel is a very important historical reference, he was absolutely wrong about Israel's demise. So this is really interesting. Israel continued to live in and control the region for the next 600 years. So he was bragging about how he took Israel and how he laid them waste and how he destroyed them. But uh, he says, Israel is laid waste. Its seed is not. Peru, that is Syria slash Cana, is become a widow for Egypt. So this one line mentions Israel. And as I said, it's one of the earliest record instances, recorded instances of the name outside of the Bible, but it's not the only one. And there's actually another one that's just come to light that's, that could has been dated even earlier than that. We'll talk about it at the end, the Berlin Stella Pedestal. And so for a long time, everyone claimed that this was the only direct mention of Israel in Egyptian records. With the Berlin Stella now, we know there's another one. So uh, they were aware of Israel, and it's in the Egyptian record. They were already in Canaan prior to 1208 BC. Uh, so here's the pedestal. It was purchased in 1913 by the Egyptologist Ludwig Borch, and an unprovenanced artifact, so they don't know where it came from, but it was in the museum and uh, in Munich, and the Egyptian archaeologist Manfred Gore was rooted around and found it in the uh, museum and was able to um, identify it as the three different uh, regions or um, people group. These are, these are not actual cartouches. We generally accept these to be uh, people groups. They're listed on some of the reliefs. We have them in Karnak and the temple there in Egypt. And so this is not uncommon. So there's every there's no reason to believe that these are not uh, legitimate, and and uh, even though they weren't found in situ, but uh, this one says that they had conquered Ashkelon. This one says they had conquered Canaan, and this one says they had conquered Israel. Now it's broken, but it was very easy for it to be repaired. And I did a drawing of it here. So this is what the Israel um, people group cartouche looks like. You can see the eagle and the eye and the feather and um, I forget the name of that one, but it's uh, it's very easy for it. It's the three three triangles on a, on, a, on a flat plane. And then of course they are bound here with their hands behind their back. And that's the same in all of them. You can see it here. So it's a common repetitive but it just has a different name in it. And this one says Israel. 
Again, some scholars argue that it's not, but some say that it's a uh, king or so, no, you know, something of kingdom. It's pretty accurate that this is what uh, it refers to, a people group that had been conquered uh, by the Egyptians. So the name Israel, these are the, the four, as well as the fifth for the Manapastele. So we have five artifacts that, that have the name Israel on them. Two of them are from Egypt. One is from Moab, from the Moabite kingdom, and one is from the Assyrian, the Kirk, um, Kirk uh, stele. But I want to put these on a, a timeline as we did before. The Berlin pedestal is probably the earliest. Now, they date it from 1453 to 1213. So basically, they date it from between, between the early date and the late date. So in this period right here, the late date and the early date, but it mentions Israel. So it appears to be arguing, it could, could argue for the late date, but it could also argue from the early date. The Merneppa Stella dates to 1208. So that places it uh, just before the, uh, the late date of the Exodus. Uh, the, the Kirk Stella places it up here at that, uh, that time period, just after David and Solomon. So Israel was known to be a kingdom. It's the divided kingdom period. And the Mesha Stele, as well as the Tel Dan Stele, uh, which also mentions the name David, but also it has the name Israel on it. So there are the, different, uh, the five different Steles that have the name Israel. So Israel was a, a nation to be reckoned with. Its, na its name is mentioned in these major steles uh, with conquered people. So when Israel Finkelstein says that King David uh, was just a little uh, chieftain, um, he's big enough that he catches the attention of the Egyptians. And Israel is a known kingdom that is on the map. And these five steles give indication that they were, they were fought against as a major nation. Uh, during those different through this whole historical period um, that would cover the the period of of the Exodus, uh, the Pharaohs, Judges, David and Solomon, and up into the divided kingdom. So that is very interesting. I've never seen that before. The way you have it laid out there, I don't, I've never seen anybody list it. Yeah, even in, in, I did that this morning actually before the podcast, okay. thinking that. I wanted to show it on a timeline for my own purposes to get my head around things. I'm a graphics person. And so I, I like to see things laid out um, in a chronological order. Um, again, some of these dates on these steles, especially the, the Berlin's pedestal and the Merneptha, they can fluctuate a little bit. But mm -hmm. uh, the Berlin stele from the, you know, the early to the late dates, somewhere in there is where they date it. But uh, we don't know for sure, but we know that these nations were conquered uh, during that time period. Well, that's a very fair way to say it. I just want to say up front, so the audience realizes how fair you are in describing between uh, late date and early date. It, you really didn't give any total value to one biased or the other. And I really appreciate that for this program. The Berlin pedestal, I'd like to see the whole thing, you know, to yes. how it is in, in its context. Is it in a wall? Is it on an actual pedestal? Well, you know what? In the um, in one of our podcasts, we showed the yes. Egyptian pharaohs, and, and one of them has that actual image on it mm -hmm. from the uh, Karak Temple. And it has these uh, people groups laid out in the exact same way. And right. one of them has Judah on it. So yes. we, have, we have the idea that's presented there, the Berlin pedestal. Um, looks like it was a copy. At what time period it is, it's difficult to say. But um, it's pretty relevant, I think, to, to identifying Israel at that time period, somewhere in that vicinity. That's pretty extensive. That's 18th and 19th dynasty. Yeah. Uh, so 
Yeah, like you said. <laughs> so somebody they, wants to, to use they that. They do the or, dating this way. They just kind of put it in a um, in a category of oh, it's somewhere between the early date and the late date. <laughs> well, it, it is interesting because it shows them bound. Uh, in the pedestal, Berlin pedestal. So they're as if they are captive. They're they conquered. Yeah. And of course, in the Merneptah Stila, which you said was Ramsey's 13th son. And you got it to 1208. And I've, I've seen it even earlier where people have placed it. I mean, uh, archaeologists have placed it around 1220 or so. So yep. I think 1208 is a very fair date for the Merneptah Stila where... Israel is mentioned once again as laid waste, really in a way, a captive. That's they, 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 they're captive or whatever, however you want to say yeah. it. Yeah. And um, uh, Verneptor Stila actually was um, has a lot more than just Israel in there. I didn't show it, but the biblical account states that you know Israel was not captive, captured, mm -hmm. um, and so we have we have the Egyptian record of it bragging about their conquest and then we have the biblical record stating it from their perspective and how uh yeah they didn't do it uh they attacked us and laid siege but they didn't conquer didn't conquer us and then of course later uh, during the uh, divided kingdom in the time of david and solomon uh, we have the mention of israel again because mm -hmm. it's a, a happening place and uh, a nation to be contended with and so they attack it. So we have the, the Moabites talking about it, Mesha, king of the Moab. We have the uh, Babylonians um, speaking about it. And then we have the Tel Dan Stele. I heard commentary from Egyptologists talking about why the Egyptians, and this was interesting because it was different than what I heard before, where, where you did state the Egyptians didn't put their losses on their buildings. And uh, in a way where they don't want people to know their losses. And this Egyptologist, uh, he, he also stated, and I thought it was interesting, another, it was, I'll just say, another point of view where it just comes from another school, a school of Egyptology, mm -hmm. um, where the Egyptians, well, their homes were made out of mud brick, but their temples are made out of stone. And these temples are dedicated to their deities. And right. they don't put losses on the temples of their deities because you just don't do that. It's out of respect for your deity. And of course, your wins, what, uh, you know, even in the Bible, a loss is a sin of the people. A win is because you have the favor of the deity. Right. So you don't put losses. You do what this God has done for you on the temple. And I thought that was very interesting because, in a way, it, it takes away the notion that the Egyptians are lying to everybody. <laughs> and I think like, you know, we know when you lost, because if you never lost a battle, you'd still be here. <laughs> you don't want to, you don't want to embarrass your gods. <laughs> you don't want to embarrass your God. Exactly. And I thought from another point of view, that was, that was, that was, I never heard that one. And that was pretty good. You know, Yeah. yeah. I was looking for something else in the Berlin uh, pedestal. And I, I was hoping that it'd help us kind of narrow the understanding of the relevancy of the uh, Armana letters. One discovery would lead to more questions, of course. And in the, in the Armana letters, I, don't, I just don't want to repeat what people already know, but of course they are correspondence with the Egyptian Pharaoh. Right. And in Canaan, they're asking, some of them are asking for assistance because they're being overrun by a, a group of people that are called Hapiru. And of course the dates, or it could be Hapiru, Haparu, whatever. But the Haparu. thing is, is that the, the, some would say, oh, these are the Hebrews. And others say, well, they're not the Hebrews. I was kind of hoping a little bit that that would help identify exactly what was going on in Canaan at that time with the Berlin uh, pedestal. But with that wide range of a date, um, I no, but it does mention Israel fair enough. It would be yeah. interesting to see if Israel would be mentioned in earlier on because we do have the Sashu being mentioned, 
yeah. in a hieroglyph as the sashu of ya- of Yahweh. Yeah. Um, we not, we don't have anything in the Egyptian records that I know of so far which would say Israel of Yahweh. I don't mean to be re- disrespectful of uh, the pronunciation, folks. All right, I could say Adonai, but I'm trying to be in reference to Egyptian uh, artifacts relating to the uh, the names. The tetragrammaton. And, it's, yes, uh, thank you. Fair enough. Yeah. So and, it's. Uh, yeah, what's really interesting is that that a lot of these um, artifacts that we're discovering uh, give us little glimpses, little peek into the cultural background the time periods, uh, but it doesn't help solve the early date or the late date um, d- debate as we have it today. Um, so there are some good arguments that are made for the late date, and, and they're really complicated, and you have to lo- know a lot about Egyptian chronology and, and Egyptian history for the early date and the late date. And so uh, I'm, I'm not into that. I don't get into that, but uh, I just find that these artifacts help us to um, sort of fill in some of the gaps, um, but they don't help answer the question. Well, no, but it is very interesting. And I really do appreciate this chart because this is really clever. I like that. And uh, what we talk about, you know, there's all, you can see all kinds of tons of material on YouTube about, you know, people debating over who's the favorite of the Exodus. It's actually quite fun because they can get a little nasty. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, what's uh, interesting... Know, What's interesting is that with the Berlin pedestal, um, it's, it's it predates the Merneptah stele, um, mm-hmm. so it's very early. Um, and there we have the mention of Israel being mentioned as a nation, a conquered peoples. So um, how that fits into, you know, the late date or the early date, um, it does point toward an earlier date than um, the, the late date in Ramsey with Pharaoh Ramses. Well, so, you know, it'd be interesting within all those, you said uh, the the names of cities or names of people groups yeah. um, on the Berlin pedestal. And of course, it's it's has much more than just the one that you're showing right here. Yeah. Uh, if, if it listed cities like Ashkelon, Gezer, Lachish, and in that they listed cities that no longer existed in the 19th dynasty, that would make it conclusive. That would be interesting. See yeah. where I'm going? Yeah. I just, but it realized, does it, but... I just realized that the uh, when I was in a rush today, a f- few hours ago, when I was putting this together, that I, I forgot to uh, shift all of the pharaohs in the bottom. So those, those are out of, uh, those are not part of the timeline. <laughs> That's okay. So Ramses II would, would, would squeeze down to the late date because what I did, I used a previous, I used the previous timeline and I just shuffled everything around, but I forgot mm-hmm. to move the pharaohs at the bottom. So uh, just for the viewers to uh, do not, uh, I'll, I'll change that when I, when I get offline here today. But uh, Ramses right. II should be down below the late date period. So all of those pharaohs can be squeezed because um, I just uh, expanded the timeline from the previous one. Mm-hmm. You know, actually, I didn't even notice that because the focus was on the uh, really on the Steelers. Yeah, I just noticed it myself. <laughs> but, uh, that, but it is very interesting. Yeah. You got one, two, three, four, five mentionings of Israel. You always hear about the Israel Steeler. And then. Of course, the Mesha Stila. And when we talk about Tel Dan, it's always about mentioning the House of David. Yeah. Um, but to put it in this kind of context, it is very extensive to have this much information mentioning Israel at such an early date, Israel. And so the Tel Dan Stella is not mentioned specifically King David himself, because he's mm. way back here. This is when David lived, this this area right here. But it's talking about... Um, you know, the nation of King David. Like a so dynasty period, yeah. A dynasty, exactly. Yeah. And so it's, it is the Davidic dynasty uh, that he's being referred to here of Israel. So um, it's not specifically mentioning David 
as an individual himself living at that time period that's talking about his kingdom or the peoples. Okay. Well, you know, for our listening audience, uh, seeing this uh, presentation, um, to get some dialogue, join in, because there is tons of controversies on the early date, late date, but don't concentrate on that. This is not what this is about. But what would be nice, if you'd like, is to add to, you could say, the in-betweens. Uh, like I did something, with, I mentioned the Armana letters. It'd be nice to, to be able to use how these might affect our understanding of the, the uh, Armana letters or the Berlin pedestal. If we took a look at the Berlin pedestal and looked at all the different uh, cities that are mentioned in it, are there any that only existed in the 18th dynasty that we know definitely don't exist in the 19th dynasty or vice versa would that be? That'd be hmm. very interesting. Because then we'd have Israel being mentioned in a certain Egyptian dynasty, right? Yeah. Uh, that that would and be that. Would, and that what's would be important fun. here is that Israel is um, is known and understood as a major player in the region, having been conquered and having been interacting with um, during this particular period. I. You know, the divided kingdom, the time of David and Solomon, um, down through the judges, uh, right to the time period of the Exodus. So coming out of Egypt, coming out of Mesopotamia, coming out of Tel Dan, we have Israel recognized as a major player um, and not just some um, hiccup or some you know tribal chieftain or some insignificant, um, non-existent uh, nation. It's uh, recognized in stone. Okay. Let me throw something else out there for the listening audience, just to, to bring in some dialogue. And um, we always hear how, if we even use the Berlin Steel and mentioning of Israel, we're not to steal a mentioning of Israel. And it's mentioning an Egyptian record of Israel in the land of Canaan. Mm -hmm. Now, let me just say this. I don't want people to get angry. I just wanted to be a, another thought pattern. Egypt is recording Israel in the land of Canaan mm -hmm. on these stelas. I think that could be definite. Just because they're in the land of Canaan, does that mean they actually came out of Egypt? Does that really is that really a record of an exodus at all? Mm. Exodus at all? I'm just throwing it out there. I'm mm -hmm. being a troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> so, man, if you want to call me names, go ahead. A bald headed old man. I already know that. <laughs> well, that's again, just fine. All of these little clues help us trying to put the puzzle together and make sense of the um, the historical record. The biblical record, and the biblical account is true and took place and happened. Uh, but trying to fit this stuff all together uh, with the archaeological record is still a bit of a, a puzzle. I don't think it's as cut and dried as, every, as some people want to you know, make it out to be. It uh, doesn't mean right. the biblical account's not true. It just means that we haven't figured out the puzzle yet. Well, I know. But, you know, even though I threw something out there, that can be a focus of a talk, too. Not, not for us, but uh, yep. you could say, well, if somebody wanted to raise some controversy, that would be a good controversy right there, you know, because you don't hear people talking about it. In that perspective, they say, well, Israel is in Canaan because of the Merneptah Stila or the Berlin, Berlin, Berlin Stila, and that proves the Exodus. But what if some scholar, let's say critical, used it? It would be nice to be aware of that as, you could say, an attorney in a courtroom, right? Yeah. Like, um, we just have to instance, be careful. We we don't take the evidence further than it uh, than it demands, and so we can only take the evidence as far as the evidence will 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 take it. Uh, we, we have to be careful that we don't try and impose um, our understanding of the biblical record onto the um, the archaeological record and uh, and twist it. So let 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 the archaeology speak for itself. 
let the chips fall where they may. Um, and I, I believe that eventually everything is going to sort itself out and that the Bible was is certainly true. Here's something else that doesn't have to do with whether it, well, it's just fun stuff. I was having an audience with years ago with uh, Professor Abraham Baran at mm -hmm. the Hebrew Union College in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about the Tell Dan Stila because, of course, he's well known for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, well, he was telling me, he goes, well, George, he goes, do you realize that uh, there are scholars out there that claim that this doesn't really state uh, David, the house of David, Beit David. It doesn't say that. It actually means something else as a form of the dynasty, but not referring to David at all. I said, well, no, I never even thought of it that way. Uh, and then he said, well, let me tell you something else that's even more. He goes, it wasn't troubling for me, but it just comes to show you how desperate people are sometimes to have a very critical view. Now, I'm not saying critical is bad, but sometimes people use, and even scholars use, uh, you could say, being critical as a way of trying to totally disprove as they got enmity about the Bible. I can see somebody being critical in their studies, critical in their archaeology as being, you know, like very exact. But then there's also a critical as being almost mean. Mm. And he was telling me, he goes, you know, they actually said that they think that this is a forgery and that the stela was placed there to be found. Wow. So he said that now he says, but, and he goes, we got no way of knowing the future, but within the next couple of seasons, we found another piece to the stela. And right. you can see in yours, yours, yours has got the complete Tell Dan Stila, but that's like a total of three pieces put together over a period of seasons where they found it. Yeah. And of course, you can see how they connect. I just like to put that out there, how sometimes things can be critical. And, um, and yeah, there's no way that's, like uh, you said, there's no way that's manufactured, no placed in, in placed some in spot. spot. This is, these are the actual pieces yeah. that have been found in different locations and areas and, mm. and put together. So, uh, yeah, there's no doubt in my mind that it's legitimate. As an archaeologist, I don't believe that the Bible needs to be proved true. The Bible stands on its own. It's self-authenticating. Um, and these artifacts merely uh, give support for the biblical narrative. They don't prove the Bible true. And I, that's a, a subtle distinction, but one I hear all the time. People keep saying, oh, these things prove the Bible's true. The Bible doesn't need to be proved true. These things support the biblical narrative. If you put archaeology mm -hmm. above the biblical record, uh, then archaeology becomes superior to Scripture. And uh, that is a big um, apologetic problem for me um, because I believe that the Bible is inspired, um, it's inerrant, and that it is um, over the archaeology and superior to it. So I don't reverse it and turn it upside down, putting archaeology over and superior to Scripture. And that's what it would be if I say it proved the Bible. Otherwise, you'd find something that could disprove the Bible in archaeology, supposedly. And then what happens to Scripture? It becomes so um, subservient to archaeology. So keep it in perspective. You know, Keep the Scripture on top. Keep the um, artifacts underneath scripture as supporting evidence. And um, in that way, I think you have a, a, a proper apologetic. A little bit of a side note. That's my personal belief. I understand. And fair enough. You know, you, you, you said that before. And I, uh, so, yeah. so that people know where you stand. And you're also very fair about telling, you know, where, where the early date is or the late date and where these fall into chronology. And uh, I could see somebody getting that Berlin Stila if they wanted to, and if they were a fan of the early date, say, well, this fits into the, in a, and you give a, an exact early early date for it. You know what I mean? Somewhere mm -hmm. in the 18th dynasty. Or if you want to be a late dater and you want to kind of like, then you just tell about, let's say, well, it dates to 12. This is how, you, I've heard stuff go before, right? It's like, yeah. look at the dates that you got for Berlin Stila. 
1453, that could be 18th dynasty, right? Or you could say 1213, that's 19th dynasty. So I could be still honest and say, hey, the Berlin pedestal dates to 1213 BC if I want it to fit and make it seem like it fits Yeah, the late date. Or if I want to be early date, I could turn around and say, and the date of the Berlin pedestal is 1453, which proves. So I could, and I'm sure we've all heard things like that before. And another offender is people using, in a way, um, carbon dating, plus or yeah. minus. Instead yeah. of being honest with it and say like, oh, this can date 1400, but plus or minus 100 years. Well, that could throw it either way. That could throw it into 18th dynasty or 19th dynasty. But they, for some reason, failed to say that, and they wanted to just throw it within the light of a certain period. So yeah. I think people should be aware of that, you know. Uh, be yeah, careful should, with the dating. Be, be very careful. Be fair with the evidence and objective about the evidence, uh, and I'm not threatened by it. Uh, I don't believe there's mm -hmm. going to be an archaeological find that's going to um, ultimately, you know, completely destroy the Bible. Uh, that's just not going to happen. Um, and that's perhaps a matter of faith, uh, but that's where I lie. Um, and that's my belief system, my presuppositions. Um, I believe that it's true and it took place. And how all of this fits in, um, well, I think eventually this will all get sorted out and we'll, uh, we'll know the truth and the Bible will be vindicated. Um, but I'm not basing my, uh, my belief system on the artifacts i'm basing it on the objective truth of the word of god right well you know uh, once again i appreciate your time i wish i could think of something else i could throw in here to get some dialogue going and uh, get people thinking and and, and and throw stuff at us with um with questions and even between your dialogues just keep it nice people is the, there's plenty of stuff out there that debating early and late date we know that uh and uh that's that's been around for a long time um one thing i haven't seen yet within the exodus is proof, to, proof that there's dinosaurs <laughs> <laughs> i think that a, a lot of our listeners probably have never heard of the berlin pedestal before um it's a fairly uh, relatively new uh, announcement it's been it's been around for a long time it was excavated very really early but uh, only recently was it uh, identified and recognized in the museum so uh, who knows what else they'll find in the archives uh, of all the um, tablets they have at the british museum 130,000 still untranslated um, wow that's right yeah. what'll turn up maybe tomorrow or the next day uh, and can change things but uh, and these are a few of the important ones um, that there's no doubt in my mind that Israel existed in that time period and that uh, David and his kingdom uh, were uh, a nation to be reckoned with from the surrounding uh, surrounding nations. So before you take off, could you bring us back that slide where you actually finished the, the hieroglyph for Israel on the Berlin Stila? You, you, you finished it right here. It's broken. That's really cool. I like that. Yeah. So let's let's just see how, you know how uh, the Egyptians, and look at the it's a Semitic person. I use a Semit, but look at the hairstyle. Yeah, Semite. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. if you look at the Karnak Temple, um, and the there's a, a large large panel that has over I think 450 of these different nations that are depicted in this manner. With all the names of every nation, and not just nations. In that case, in the Karnak Temple, it was actually every city in Canaan mm -hmm. that they had conquered, and so it mentions uh, mentions Jerusalem, and uh, mentions you know Jericho, and mentions all the different nations or cities that have been conquered, um, and then here we have the exact same image type of image. Um, depicting Israel and Ashkelon and Canaan. So there's right. no doubt in my mind that it's a legitimate uh, hieroglyph and relief yeah. and uh, the dating. Yeah. Well, I could just, I could just squeeze Israel in there. Like we got to have Israel in there. Let's squeeze them in there. 
Hey, thanks. This was great. I really appreciate it. This was much more than what I thought. I had a great time. And uh, your once again, your PowerPoints and graphics are are um, just fantastic. I mean, I can't appreciate how much work you've done. Not only that, folks, he's been putting together uh, slides uh, for Bible Interact, uh, the intro slides. And uh, so, Dr. Graves, I really appreciate everything that you've done. And for the listening audience out there, um, within the past week, our subscribers have jumped some six, 7,000 more subscribers. And I really want to thank you for subscribing and being a part of what Bible Interact is doing, and especially our little podcast that we do right here, Archaeology from the Ground Down. Doctor, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. And this information is uh, fantastic in labeling the stela, the archaeological evidence that we have of Israel being mentioned in in history, very illuminating. Thank and you. George, to remind all of our listeners that all of my 35 books, with the footnotes and the receipts, if you want to do some further digging and research, are all available on Amazon.com. That's right. Now, folks, I got they keep them right here. I don't know. There's a, there's one right there. And this is the New Testament. And yeah, for all those new subscribers that just came in, uh, Dr. Graves has a selection of bo books that in time, all these podcasts and all these PowerPoints that will line up with his books. So not only will you get his books, but you can go on YouTube and if you want to have a presentation of, of different parts of the books. Okay, hmm. um, uh, available for you. So, it used to be years ago that we'd have to get get a book, and then there'd be a little DVD in the back, right? Hmm. And then we'd have to put the DVD, and it would kind of correspond with the book. But now we got all this great stuff off of YouTube. So this is what's going to happen, folks. This is going to line up with his books. We already finished up uh, his book on Jesus speaks to the seven churches. And I believe all seven churches are now on YouTube. So you can purchase the book, Jesus Speaks to the Seven Churches. Some fantastic information out there, especially with Hot and Cold. Got a lot of good comments on that. That was a novelty approach with the understanding of Hot and Cold and also the information of how to understand 666 in his book mm -hmm. and also on YouTube podcast. Doctor, thank you for your time and all this hard work. Look at all this hard work right here. And that's just one out of how many books you've got now? A dozen? 35. Ooh. That's, that's not just a book, people. That's an encyclopedia set. Yeah. So, no, it's been a life, right. but, uh, lifetime of research. And you know what? It's great information. I got them. And the thing is, is that it'd be great for your home reference. And also, do your church a favor. And get tell your pastor, get the elders or whatever, and uh, see if they want to purchase these books for uh, information uh, for your church and also information for the sermons. You know, if you somebody's or for a guest lecture, how many uh, pastors might have an archaeologist come and speak at his church or her church, and uh, and how many pastors really know anything about archaeology? Mm. Very little. So mm. how do you know if it's not, you know, if it's pseudo-archaeology or it's just sensationalism or it's really legit archaeology? I could tell you that if you get David's books, you're going to get a lot of great information there. It's going to put you on the right track. Mm. All right. Have I plugged the books pretty good? Did a good job, George. Thank you. All right. All right. <laughs> no, but I'm sincere, folks. Once again. Uh, thanks for your time, Doctor. And people, thanks for being a part of Bible Interact today. Don't forget to like and subscribe. You know, ring the bell. You know what to do. Have a good day.